Sure. I'll talk it out. Yeah. Let's just have a conversation. Track three. <clears throat> Better not be fucking Dave Matthews bound. Okay. Those of you who don't want to be a part of this can leave now. Derek, please listen to me. But if you choose to stay, which it seems like you guys are choosing. Derek, please. You understand and agree to the following terms and conditions. Derek. One. Derek, this is the virus. You talking. hereby waive your right Derek, please. to your own personal bodily integrity. This is not you. Two. Per the state versus Neville Reed. My colleague and I will not be held criminally liable for any felony or misdemeanor that you may be a victim of, including, but not limited to, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, disorderly conduct, destruction of property, mayhem, and first degree murder. And three, terms and conditions may change or be updated whenever the fuck I want! Consider yourselves notified. up everyone dj anubis here with you on the metal time radio podcast with my co-host the great kevin lambert from the entertainment headquarters thank you sir for joining me again today for another episode of the cinematic synergy and this time around we uh did studio 666 so i've been looking forward to watching this for a while when it got announced and uh, i was surprised when i saw it on tubi like hey that sounds like a good movie to watch and uh sent uh Told Mr. Lambert, this is what we're doing. He's like, I like this idea. So, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Let's break down what it's all about. So, Studio 666 is a 2022 film uh, directed by BJ McConnell or McDonald, excuse me. Uh, cast consists of Foo Fighters, the band, Whitney Cummings, the comedian, Jenna Ortega, Carrie King from Slayer, has cameos of John Carpenter and Lionel Richie in here. Plot is. Legendary rock band, Foo Fighters move into an Encino mansion steeped in grisly rock and roll history to record their much-anticipated 10th album. So, uh, your first impressions. First impressions right out of the uh, gate is it starts with a bang. As you know, we both like a bit of horror, we like a bit of gore, we like a bit of, you know, 
valence here and there and this film starts with a bang with a great kill right at the beginning it basically sets the tone in you know for what's to come later on throughout the course of the film and of course this film was also written i believe it's based on a story by um david Grohl, uh, yeah. yeah david Grohl. yeah so the idea that he's taken an idea a concept that he's written and he's managed to get it made and he's done it so visually beautiful in terms of the effects of, yeah. with the with the kills and the story's a decent story you know and it give me you know it felt like a, a mixture of say the evil dead and american horror story combined yeah. uh one of the actresses that in this which is she plays leslie grossman as you know she's a big part of the american horror story franchise and right. she plays a decent part in this so it was nice to see her in this and like i say first impressions start with the bang and it continues not to let you down yeah and it's funny because that <clears throat> opening scene um when we see uh actually jenna ortega's character get killed like i didn't even know it was her initially i didn't recognize her right away until i looked at the cast notes i'm like oh shit, that was her like i just didn't really recognize her. so it was kind of cool that she was in this uh and then of course neko and i when we saw carrie king and what his death uh, came kind of early on with getting electrocuted uh that was a lot of fun uh yeah so it's I, I didn't really do like a super deep dive, which I, I should have, but I kind of ran out of time. But I'm really curious of how Dave came up with the concept for this, because between that and how that like the special effects are fucking amazing in this. Like, they're just so good. Lots and of practical like, effects as well. Yeah, which, yeah. And which so, is what I loved about this. It was it took like like obviously you said he's obviously clearly as well inspired by um Oh, John Carpenter, who makes an appearance in this. Yeah. Is it, yeah, he makes, like, a, you know, an appearance in this. So he's clearly inspired by his past work, especially when it comes to the practical effects. Right. Yeah, so uh, basically what happens is we start out with Dave and company. They're back. I think they're in L.A., and they're there with their uh, label manager. And, <laughs> you know, they're kind of coming up with the concept for their 10th record. They want to make it stand out. And so the label manager is like, you know, they're, first they're kind of just joking around about movies. They're talking about like old stuff that, you know, obviously having fun. And then the manager comes in and he's like, you know, Sting's very good too, but he puts out records. So there's a lot of cool, like comedic sarcasm throughout this film, which I think is great too. Uh, I've always known that the Foo Fighters going way back when they started have a very comedic tone about them. So you mm -hmm. go back to... I forget which song it was for, but it was the, they did like a Mentos commercial. Do you remember? It was called Futos. Yeah. So nice. you had that going on. Then you had Everlong, in which, of course, uh, the band is like trying to get inspiration to write their 10th record. So the manager suggests going to this mansion uh, that will give them some inspiration to do this. And so they pack up, go there, and Leslie Grossman, the character that I guess plays like the real skater or like yeah she's just, just like the realtor guy. who's well don't forget right at the beginning of the movie when they're talking about the 10th album because it is the 10th album they want to make it like i guess one of the better albums of the, of the catalog and i guess yeah. like a 10th anniversary type mega album and right. the manager you know david gold's kind of he's like when I record this album, I want to make it slightly different. I want to make it unique to the work we've already done. So I want to record it in a venue or a location that's outside of the box of stuff we've done before. And that's when the manager it was like, you know, saying, right, if, we're good, if you want to do that, I know the perfect location. It's something you've never done before. Right. And just make me he just he basically says make me some fucking money basically yeah he, he comes across as just like one of them sleaze bag managers that's all about profit and not not about the artistry of music and you know 
the work that goes into making an album is all about album sales and you know hitting stuff like that so he's yep. the one that gets on the phone and basically rings the realtor played by leslie grossman's character and she's like i know the perfect place as well and you the walk in and it just looks creepy as hell it's you know you can tell there's a mystery about the place it's like run down she's all like yeah, and you guys can have all the hot chicks around the pool. Meanwhile, the pool is like a mess. It's like got leaves and tra- branches inside of it. It's like just looks like ass. <laughs> but uh, at first, we they get in there and like you know, their girls like, I don't know, man. This place just it feels like doom. Like I don't know if I'm really feeling it. And then like here's like this echo within the walls. Yeah. He's like, whoop, wait a minute. Yeah, this would be great. I like this. And so. Uh, they get to work uh, basically settling in, and for one thing, they've got, for whatever reason, Grohl has, like, a guy deliver steaks and shit to him, like, with extra ranch, like, all this shit that's coming to yeah. him. Uh, of course, they grill a lot. That becomes a big factor in this film. Uh, we talked about, you know, Carrie King when they're first kind of setting up their equipment and trying to get everything sorted. Uh, King is electrocuted and burnt like yeah. a crispy critter. Uh course uh i I don't think did did leslie's character tell them about the the past tragedy or was that just whitney i can't remember i know whitney did it but um i don't don't think think leslie mentioned it i don't think i think no i'm sure i think she mentioned i think she was going to or she was well, she said they never finished the record so she didn't say yeah yeah, yeah she, she hit, i think she mentioned that a previous band had been there and they hadn't finished the record it's yeah. the nosy neighbor chick who um gets banged later on in a very nice yeah. way <laughs> yeah the um by um, one of the members of the band who um yeah. rami she, yeah, she's like, she basically fills him in on the goings out. But obviously, at that point, David Gohl, who obviously, this is the band, it is Foo Fighters, but obviously this this is like a more fictional kind of comedic turn of who they really are. In right. they're, they're not, they're obviously, yes, they're themselves, but they're playing, they're playing up to the camera and they're playing like themselves in character form. Right. And, um... To be honest, I was one thing I will say. I was amazed at how good they were as like actors. Yeah. Because you yeah. know you see you see them like in the band and they're like doing their thing on tour and things. But I kind of always knew that uh, David Gold. He he he. I could see he had like an acting bug in him because. I never, um, I never knew for years later that he played the devil in the Tenacious D music video. Oh, I didn't remember. know that either. Yeah, he, but, yeah uh, he's, he's the devil in that. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, but I was thinking back, like, even because, you know, I talked about those earlier videos, but even, like, uh, Monkey Business, mm-hmm. uh, just, like, you know, he, the elevator scene and everything, like, he, he has, you can see it throughout this, like, they all did a great job acting, but Dave has a real knack for it. Like, it's yeah. really funny. Like, I would love to see him in just about any other, like, weird role that he can do. Uh, there is that scene <clears throat> where we first get introduced to uh, the the groupie chick next door, Whitney. Uh, for those that know, Whitney Cummings is like a, a comedian, and she was in a show for a while called Whitney, which was incredibly funny if you've never seen it. But she's actually a very funny chick. So she's playing the neighbor, Samantha, who's like nosy and everything. And uh, when she first introduces herself to everybody, <laughs> Rami's like – trying to hit on her and then there's like a moment where Dave's like okay Romeo let's go you know he's like making fun it's like we gotta go now you know but Dave just it's so subtle how his comedic style is that I think it's underappreciated and yeah. uh, I was really blown away by this and uh, so anyway getting back to the story um, basically they're, they're trying to work on new material trying to brainstorm and there's the moments where Dave starts going through the old catalog. He's like, yeah, what about this riff? And it's, of course, Everlong. And then, you know, the guys are like, yeah, we did that like 20 years ago. So he's like, fuck, I got a block. I can't get through it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there's another moment where he's kind of by himself, Dave is, and he's playing the piano and he's, he thinks he's got something new again. And all of a sudden, 
we see like the, this cameo by Lionel Richie, and he's like, "Look, man, uh, I appreciate you liking the song, but that's my song, mine." He starts walking. Mm. He's like, "Leave my song alone." Yeah, so it's like again, a dream sequence, right? So he's like, obviously, they're sitting around at the beginning of that before that happened, and they're trying to brainstorm. They've set up the band. There's, you know, all the equipment. They've had that tragic electrocution happen which was fucking even the, even the the makeup skills on you know were yeah. fantastic and yeah. then they go to bed that night and he's having he has about three or four different dreams and that's the funniest like if you think of Foo Fighters you don't think of right Lionel Richie and, right. <laughs> and when he's dreaming and then he pops up and he goes listen that's a good song, isn't it? I love that song, but it's my fucking song. Yeah. Get your own, get your own song. And he's ranting at him as he's going out the door, and then he's right. like looking there, like, what the fuck has just happened in his dream sequence? And then the next sequence is a bit more dark, because he then sees visions of these demon things, and then f prior to that, before the electrician, electrocution either, like I said before, you can there's like this feel of the house, and he's walking around the house and the set, and, the, and he can hear noises, and it's like he's being taunted to something. It's right. like something's echoing to him or pulling him in, but no one, no one else around is hearing the things going on, which yep. was a great part of the story, which really sets up what happens next. Yeah. So eventually, uh. Dave finds like I think it's like a basement somewhere outside or around the house somewhere and he goes down there and he discovers like this room where this like old school like music tape like the way they used to record music back in the day with a reel to reel uh, he discovers that and he, he starts playing it and like I gotta admit man the song the riffs are like very Black Sabbath-y so I really enjoyed the shit out of it but he's like psyched. He's like, this is great. Because apparently this was the work or the, the music created by Dream Widow, which was that opening band that we saw at the beginning, uh, get slaughtered. So he's listening to their riffs and he's like, yeah, we, we, I got to do this. This is what I got to do. So he then ends up doing this to the guys the next morning. <laughs> Yeah, man. Woo! Woo! Fuck. It was like you were musically constipated, and now you just took the biggest musical shit on us. <laughs> Fucking awesome. No, right? I'm still working on it. It's like a hundred ideas in my head. I just fighting to get out. Could be a double, maybe a triple album. I don't know. Let's <laughs> get to work. Fuck you, Nate. Don't tell me what to do, asshole. I told you'd come, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah. obviously while he was down there uh something took possession of dave Grohl, and so he's at that point introducing this new the l sharp as he calls it for his uh riff and so even when the guys are like what well, what is it like a low e he's like no it's l <laughs> he just has to correct them it's l and so he really spends a lot of time in a movie while they're trying to work on the song. And so now it's become like this concept record, right? Mm. So it gets longer and longer. It's like 40 minutes to an hour. The guys are like, really? Does this have an end like at any time? Can we like, end this? And in the midst of all this going on, like just random shit. So like the bassist, uh, I forget his name. He ends up sleeping in the kitchen because he doesn't really have a bed. There's no bed for him in the house. So he's just yeah. Sleeping in the kitchen on the counter or on the floor. And, uh, you know, like Rami's like wearing Dave's underwear speedos for some reason, you know, whatever that reason is. <laughs> it, they're all kind of got their own little, uh, you know, uh, quirks about them in yeah. some way. Well, it's like, it's like what I said before. It's like they are the real Foo Fighters, but the playing up. To themselves in character form so like you see in real life rami is probably a real hound dog so right. they're playing up to the playing <clears throat> up to it and right. then you've got the quirky one or you've got the smart one and or you've got you know the stupid one and what they're doing is is 
in character form that, that are turning it up to a 10 and like showcasing it in film form and allowing themselves to let loose and basically take the piss out of each other and do and having fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they keep working on the song. Um, there's a moment where, uh, of course, they meet the next door neighbor, Samantha. So that's something else. And there's like, she kind of like asks him, like, are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm great. You know, because, you know, she could tell there's something wrong. She has like something that she knows. She hasn't quite told the band yet. Um, but, you know, the other thing is like when it comes to their grilling, Dave apparently like overcooks things usually. So they're, they're cracking jokes like, yeah, it's usually like bland and dry when Dave cooks. He's like, fuck you. <laughs> Down the band. <laughs> Uh, so I just, the, the humor in this is so well placed, like just the little things they do. Uh, even when it's like, you know, at one point where the bassist wants to get sleep, but Dave's like, no, I got an idea. It's probably like four in the morning or something. It's like, I got an idea. We got to do it now. And the bass is like, no, I got to go to sleep. And Dave's like, I'm sorry. What'd you say? Uh, you want, no, it starts with the N and ends with the O. And then he starts going on this rant about how, I'm Dave Grohl. No one says no to me. <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. He's <laughs> freaking out. So the guy's like, fine, I'll play with you. Just stop being a dick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but eventually, uh, like, we we sort of start getting our first taste of uh, the kills when the, the delivery guy shows back up. Uh, he, he obviously recognized Dave before and say, oh, yeah, you're Dave of the Food Fire. So cool. And I guess the next time around he's bringing stuff, he wanted to bring uh, his demo for his own band for Dave to hear. Uh, but eventually that guy doesn't even really make it past the door because he ends up getting killed out in a little wooded area behind the house, um, which we end up finding his body later on. But the kill scene again, you know, the shears and the head, like it's it's yeah. fucking great. I yeah. really, really enjoyed that. Um even the um, special effects of like the demon characters in the background, the black yeah. eye, like the black, the red eyes, smoky and... type uh, demons with the bright red eyes, watching it all unfold. It's mm -hmm. really interesting, and I, you know, and as you can see, it's, it's like they were dropping hints at the beginning, like another thing that you saw Dave Gold before going into that. Is when you could hear the noises of someone clipping this with shears, but you couldn't yep. see anybody. And yep. the next thing you know, the delivery guy he's out there looking for Dave Gold, who he thinks it is. And next thing he's getting his head his head cut off by the shears. And it's like it's like those little detail you know, details that make a movie and that make it stand out, which this yeah. does. That's why I'm curious, like like when it came to the the effects like who actually did them like that is some great work and i think i'm glad that dave took it upon himself to find somebody to do it like that like that's the way you do a movie right um so yeah it's time goes on these guys are getting frustrated with the band because dave is continuing to push them and push them and push them and they're all kind of getting tired they kind of want to go back to la they want to wrap it up uh, there is a short moment early on where Carpenter and another guy are kind of doing the soundboard mixing, but they are then leaving. And Dave's like, yeah, we got it handled from here. You know, we'll, we'll be fine. And I, of course, he has this like menacing look after they leave. Like, so this this is where the shit's going to start hitting the fan, right? Um, <clears throat> so obviously, um, when they get frustrated, the band, like uh, one of the other guys, I think he's another guitarist, uh, he's like fed up. Like he's like, I'm gonna go cook some shit on the grill, right? <laughs> so he's out there cooking, and I think one of their band goes, "Hey man, you need things?" Like, yeah, give me a beer to shove up Dave's ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's all because pissed off and frustrated. He's, yeah, he's pissed off and frustrated because obviously whatever happened when Dave Gold went into the basement of the house, it something's got a hold of him that you that you don't quite know as of yet. But he, he's not acting in character. He's like not acting his general. He's being more bossy. He's being more obsessive with the music, and it's like they're there. Yes, they're there to make an album, but they're there just to chill and relax and to work as a team. And he just seems to be getting more aggressive with it, more out of character, I guess. 
yeah. with them, and the band's starting to just get pissed off with his behaviour. He's out there, he's out of character behaviour, and he's one of them that finally steps up to the plate and basically goes, "I'm taking a break from you because you're being a dickhead and asshole. I'm gonna cook myself some hot dogs, <laughs> and I'm gonna have a beer." And as we know, it doesn't end well. Yeah, so in, anyway, the guy uh, ends up eating the grill himself, his face first. And then this is when we actually kind of discover that Dave's the one that's been running around in this little, like, gardener suit, you know. So we already find out who our killer is, which we kind of suspected that would be him anyway, just because based upon the possession and everything else. Um, but, yeah, it just as time goes on, more and more... Uh, people start dying and one of the things that happens is this is kind of where uh samantha the neighbor comes back into play with the remaining guys there i think taylor uh rami and the bassist uh are there so she's like trying to explain to them what happened to the band prior to them from like probably like the 70s i think it was or whatever and she's explaining yeah they all died you know and this this band member went nuts and killed him and then killed himself to stop, but they never finished the song. That was the whole point. Like they were supposed to finish this song, but they never did because they would have released a demon in the world or some shit like that. And so yeah. it's at this point that uh, they decide that they're going to try to distract Dave. So Taylor is going to get on his drums, try to like play them the wrong way. So that it pisses off Dave, but it keeps them occupied. Uh, while I think uh, the bassist and another guy try to find the book, there's this book that's a part of all this that needs blood and like it's gonna release the souls and shit like that. So they gotta find this book. And so Rami's like, well, you know, because Samantha just told him all this stuff. He's like, you know, now to put you in danger. Now there's gotta be somebody to watch you. So Rami took it upon himself to to go with uh, Samantha. And we kind of know what's going to happen there with that. So you you have any words for at this point? Well, he he obviously is ready to have a good time, and <laughs> and this is probably my favorite kill of the film. Oh, it is the best kill. It, it of is it is because yeah, you don't like like. I think the last thing you see is Dave Grohl. I think he's he's just sitting around somewhere and they sneak off to do all this investigating. And, you know, they're explaining how this ex-band... What, what, there was a group, and but the leader like him turned into a dick and was obsessed with this cult or something and he had this book and he was trying to, you know, free this demon or something or he's reading it, he comes obsessed with it. Shit goes down, he gets possessed, and he kills the rest of the band, and they don't finish the song. And while they're, like, getting all this information off the chick next door, Rami's like, I'll protect you. You guys, yeah. sort, you go sort him out. And then, and she's like, because she's a groupie, she's, <laughs> she's a groupie. She knows yeah, what's going to happen. she clearly go has down. a thing for Rami, so she's like, yeah, yeah okay. and so... Obviously, they sneak away, and then uh, it must be in her pool house or something. Yeah, and the best thing about this scene is like because what I'm going to show a clip from it here in a minute. But if you're an '80s person like me, uh, the the song playing in the background is uh, Jackal, and uh, it, it's called the. Um, I'm the, I'm the something baby. I forget what it is, but it has something to do with chainsaws. They got chainsaws in the background, the music. And so obviously as Rami and, and Samantha are getting it on in the bedroom, uh, you know, you talked about how Dave was last looked. He was kind of just sitting somewhere. But now we get a glimpse of him lying under the bed that they're in. <laughs> He's just smiling. It's so like... It's just, it's just so shocking because... It's the last thing you're expected to happen. Right. Like, well, I, I kind of saw something coming because he did have a chainsaw with him. And, of course, the music's playing a chainsaw. So he's, like, cranking it over underneath the bed. But, I, again, the attention to detail. Like, if I if I didn't know, like, just how good special effect artists were, I would have said this is a real snuff film because here you go. This is not kidding, dude. This is some legit shit. <laughs> 
That is just nuts. <laughs> I don't know how the fuck they did that, but that was like straight up amazing. Right? Oh my it's god! The, it, it's the face at the end when he's like proper proud of himself. On his right, <laughs> he's getting a kick out of it. Yeah, certainly uh, the best kill, and then the next one will probably be, of course, uh, the drummer Taylor. It's like I thought that was like fucking awesome too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so obviously taylor was you know purposely trying to play bad uh to keep you know dave occupied and dave's like dude i know you're fucking around we're drummers we know this so he's like play it right so eventually mm -hmm. they do they finish it and of course uh his death scene is when you know he stands up from the kit and dave's like thanks you're done takes the symbol and basically throws it almost like Kung Lao style right into Taylor's face, which then like decapitates the face from the body. And again, just it's great special effects, man. Like I just, it's amazing. Like this film is like so great. And it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's funny because you and I, we, uh, we reviewed that movie porno a while back and that had yeah. a lot of great special effects too. So really this is kind of cool because these films are more of a independent nature. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have some of the better special effects than you'll see in most modern horror. Yeah. Like that's well, what's the, crazy. The, the problem is, as we know, practical special effects are more expensive to make than yeah. CGI effects. But I've always appreciated more practical effects, and it just shows you. I, I, my mind's always boggled when people say, "Well, the budget for practical effects," but yeah, this is not a massive budget film but yet the effects are so amazing then you've got things like the nun with cgi fucking nuns running around like demons and it, it it's just it's you can just see it in the screen and it's just it's just terrible it's yeah. just absolutely terrible and then you see like works of art like this and you get a good kick out of it and you're like you're like you know, you you actually are enjoying what you're seeing on the screen, and that's the difference. So for me, when they talk about budgets and all this with CGI or practical effects, this film is proven that you don't need a big budget to have a fun film. No, yeah. If you uh, obviously Dave found the right person, maybe it might have been John. I don't know, man. I don't know how. I, I, like... Yeah, I was thinking since he made a cameo in the movie, John Carpenter might have. Put him in the I mean, right at least, direction. I mean, at least John probably knew like a good special effects man because like, yeah. you, you can probably yeah. compare a lot of this death scenes to stuff that you've seen and stuff like the thing yeah. and whatnot. So well, it's very mm -hmm. uh, detailed. Yeah, well, to have him in the film, like I say, to do a cameo, he's probably put him in the direction of somebody he knows, and he's obviously you can tell some of the death scenes or some of it is inspired by John's past work. Yep. So uh, so now we had the end of Taylor, and then the other two guys uh, in the band that were grabbing the book uh, eventually come across Dave outside, who's putting Taylor's uh, remains to a, a wood chipper <laughs> and getting rid of it. So they already know that, like, shit's just getting bad, like everyone's starting to disappear. Uh, and so now it comes a time when they're, like, by the pool, and, you know, they're trying to do an incantation to get the demon out of Dave. Like they're trying to save Dave's soul or whatever. And Dave's like, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. I'm going to break your fucking faces off. You know, he's giving him threats. He's got some demon shadows behind him. The ones that we see throughout the film. And, uh, eventually they, they get it out of Dave, but like whatever they took out of him, like starts manifesting itself from the goo on the ground. And it forms that guy from the the killer from the, the last band. And uh, Dave just starts beating the shit out of him. Like he's punching the shit out of him and trying to beat his ass. All of a sudden, these apparitions show up, which is the remaining members of Dream Widow, uh, Jen Jenna's character along with the rest of the band. And now mm -hmm. they're going to exact their revenge on the, this guy that like killed them all, in the, you know, years ago. Um but for now, here's where like kind of a little twist comes in a little bit. Um, so the, the 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 location in the basement, like where the book came from, um, there was like this raccoon, dead raccoon sitting on the wall and stuff. 
So we know there was like some sort of like satanic rites that the guy from the last band was doing, but we don't really know like any more behind the backstory. But uh, as everybody's kind of uh, disorganized after the apparitions show up and all this stuff, uh, Dave ends up coming across some hooded cloaked figures. <laughs> and uh, one of them, of course, is Leslie's character, uh, who's making her way to the other two bandmates. And then the other one is, of course, uh, I think his name's Shill, the, the manager for the label. Mm -hmm. And Dave's like, dude, why'd you send us here? This house sucks. Like, this is bad. And then Shill's, of course, like, yeah, well, you know, the devil, you know, it's time for him to rise again and make rock and roll great again. You know, it's been kind of uh, dull. And so I knew you'd be perfect to, to, to hold all the energy and evil in. And Dave's like, what? So they start getting in a little bit of a fight. And, you know, Dave's kicking them in the balls. It's kind of funny. <laughs> you know, Leslie's making her way to the other two guys who are trying to get the van going. Because it's like, I don't know if they were. Were they hot wiring it or something? I figured they were hot wiring They're trying to hot wire, but they clearly have never hot wired a fucking car in their life. <laughs> because... It, I've, it it took it took them ages and ages to hot way out a car, which ended badly. Right, and so I I don't I think I watched this twice, but I don't remember like what it is because like the basis is under there trying to do whatever it is to hot wire it, I guess, and the other guy's in the in the driver's seat. So something happens where he's impaled with something in the eye. I don't remember what that was. Do you recall what that was? It happened that fast that yeah. I didn't. It made me think: was the was the truck booby wired before? Was it some? Yeah, the only other thing I could think of was because um, you know the the basis is messing with shit underneath, and it looks like he has like a cable, but I don't know if that just popped through the steering wheel and got him. Uh, either way, like the the other guy gets stabbed in the eye, so he hits the gas. Because the van starts, obviously, and so he hits the gas, and he goes in reverse, but he runs over the bassist's his head <laughs> in the process, <laughs> killing him, and then smacks into fucking uh, Leslie Grossman's character and knocking her back. So then he gets out, he's like, Leslie? And, of course, she stabs him as she's dying, and he's dead now, too. So um, eventually we get moved back and pans back to where Dave and, and Shell are fighting each other. And Dave's, like, in the process of choking him out to death. You know, he's, like, really pissed. And uh, Shell's like, yeah, but you finished the song, didn't you? And then, of course, Dave stops, and he's kind of looking at his hands like, what have I done? And uh, I think Shell has, like, one of the better lines that I've seen in the movie. Is like, he's like, now it's time for your solo career. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so... Obviously, we kind of fast forward a little bit. and It's uh, like a year later, isn't it? Yeah, so he, the, the guy comes to his uh, dressing room. He's like, you ready to go on stage at the packed house? And he's like, yeah. And he's kind of got like this low, gruff voice. And as we as he pans to him playing the guitar, like just testing it or whatever, and he's looking up, you can see like the black veins or whatever going on there. So clearly he's still possessed, and that's pretty much how the film ends. But I, I was really, really pleased with this film. I loved mm -hmm. it a lot. Uh, it w In fact, it exceeded any expectations. I did not know how great it would be, but I just came out of this loving this film a lot. Yeah. Like, I, I'm probably where you are. Like, obviously, I like the Foo Fighters. I like, I like I've got a handful of their albums. And, the, like I say, I just thought this was really an amazing idea. It was really well written. I liked how the Foo Fighters, like I say, weren't willing were willing to take the piss out of themselves and have a laugh, and you could tell they had fun making this. The story was decent. The special effects just they, they were so surprising with how good they were, and it's a fun film. So anyone that heard of it, but if they kind of went, oh, I bet you it's one of those stupid lowbrow, you know, really shitty B movies. I'm not mm. gonna bother. Trust me, it's not. It it you will get your bang for your buck if you like practical effects with a lot of gore and decent kills, and 
it it's just a really good movie for it, it like i say it's surprising if this is based on a story by dave gore what else could he create in the future right yeah like if you're if you know for people watching this if you're like fans of like say deathgasm or uncle peckerhead this film is like almost better than both of those and i i really like those films so that's that's how well i thought this film was done like it just it's so clever uh again the band's just kind of like parodying themselves uh in this but they they're really good at it man like they took a lot of time like i don't know how long they worked on this film but they came prepared like it, it showed like they were ready to do this and like it just came out nice like i'm gonna get this on blu-ray whenever i can because yeah. i really enjoyed the shit out of this <clears throat> so your rating for this oh i would definitely have to between and i would probably have to give this an eight out of ten it's it, it's really high up there for the special effects it's really high up there for you know i did think even though i've never seen any of the the band acting anything they truly can act and they're not frightened to take the piss out of themselves and you know story wise great story but most of all what really impressed me like i've mentioned a few times just great special effects that are really surprising yep uh yeah so i i give it a nine i'm I'm actually i almost give it a 9.5 like i usually don't split it up but this is like so close to a 10 for me because i just i can watch this endlessly it's just so good yeah Uh, you know we're not talking oscar type stuff here but you know when you and i do films it's we very rarely talk about oscar films anyway so it's a good it's a good um it's a good uh horror comedy basically yes it's a good if you like a horror with with humor you're gonna get it in in this and rock and roll yeah so it's like right up there it's probably like one of those you know metal horror type stuff that you know you like to watch so uh yeah so i i really enjoyed that and uh yeah there's not much more to say i mean we pretty much covered it all um yeah. coming up uh later this week uh tomorrow uh we with uh poet as we do a recap of super bowl 58 uh it's lucky i didn't do that show like the day after because i would have been a lot more ranty yeah i was not really pleased about it <laughs> yeah uh, with the results uh, yeah so uh, but I, I, you know I've, I've had time to calm down and i'll be able to go about my ways and recap it and logically and everything so then uh friday neko and i will be doing another episode of global unscripted there's just a couple of topics that have come up it's a little bit more on the serious note that we'll be talking about but uh that's what that show is designed for yeah next week 2 p.m. on the 21st, Mr. Lambert and myself and Samurai uh, will be doing a review of First Blood. So um, yeah. be looking for that because yeah, I'm really excited yeah. about that. I'm to, I've seen it so many times, but I feel like I have to kind of watch it right before we review it just so I can yeah. sit there and not get anything. The first segment of the retro classic movie show on the entertainment headquarters. Yep. It's been something I've been wanting to do for a while, so it's great to have you on board. And obviously, we're getting our first guest on there, which is that fat samurai guy, Preston Downey. The man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> uh, then the 22nd, I will be actually visiting Mr. Samurai on his channel as we do a versus between uh, – Jason Statham's Transporter versus Jason Statham's The Beekeeper, which I have to still watch. I have not watched this, so I'm going to have to rent it, uh, yeah. which is okay. Everyone's saying it's pretty good, so I'm going to check it out. Be prepared for that. Um, Friday the 23rd, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, my time. I will begin, begin again on Mr. Lambert's channel with Neko to talk about the Monarch Legacy of Monsters series. Uh, finally get around to doing that. Yeah. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun, especially with the new trailer for Godzilla and Kong that came out uh, either yesterday or today. I can't remember which it came one. came out the day. Yeah. Yeah. So I did look at it. Um, I'm not going to do a reaction to it. I'm not going to say too much about it, but I think... I'm still hesitant, but 
Mm. You know, it may intrigue me. I, you know, as a Keiju fan, like I'm going to watch it anyway, just because that, that's what I do. That's what anybody does if they're a fan of monsters. So uh, I don't have a problem with like going to see it. Yeah. I haven't read any reactions to the trailer yet. I am going to attempt to do my own t trailer reaction if I can, but I'm like you. I was, you know, I think because of the first film, Godzilla vs. Kong, it did so well and it was a beautiful surprise just after the end of the pandemic. Everyone wanted to go back to the cinemas and it was the first major release since then and people just dived in and also I think it was the hype of seeing these two iconic characters clashing yeah. on the big screen together and it was a great film. The first film I found underwhelming because I just didn't feel it had the same kind of speciality that the that Godzilla vs Kong had yeah. and there was just elements of it that were off-putting for me like everyone's talked about the final scene in the first trailer where they run together and it felt like in a like in a superhero film but for me that's not what I was annoyed at it was just more or less it just there was just so much about it that I just wasn't inspired by if that makes right. sense so we'll see what happens you know it might be okay uh, mm -hmm. Later that night, I'm going to try to do uh, actually another classic reflections. We haven't done one in a while, me and Neko. So we're going to probably do King Diamond's Them album. So we'll be doing that. And so I'll be looking for that as well. Uh, after that, don't know. I'm going to have to get back mm -hmm. to you on that. I still have to do yeah. a new, uh, <laughs> my new uh, series with the uh, Kung Fu stuff, uh, Lone Wolf yeah. with uh, Dub. So I'll try to do another one of those. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to do on Bach. I think that's what people picked for me to do. So I'll do that one. Oh, on Bach, yeah. Yeah. yeah so well, yeah, I... what do you got coming up? Anything aside from well, your attempts from... at trailer reactions? <laughs> apart from doing attempted trailer reactions, um, of course, we've got, we said, the Retro Classic Movie Show coming on the 21st, 23rd. We've got... Uh, a Kaiju Connection segment, Legacy of Monsters review with you and Neko. I would like to try and do another My Top 10 because I did put a poll oh, yeah, on my... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did... so we, uh, you and I did talk about doing the uh, sci-fi, yeah. which I have my list ready to go. So whenever you're ready to do that, yeah. I'm all in. Mm. So obviously, yeah, because I did say I put a poll up when I did My Top 10 Shark. Uh, films so that's on my channel if people want to check that out but i put a poll up to see what a future my top 10 would be and samurai movies won but a close second was disaster movies so i'm gonna attempt to try and do that one in the near future but i also was like you've mentioned the my top 10 current sci-fi movies so what i mean by People current i would hate me <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, mm, well they might hate me you never know but uh right. what i mean by current top 10 is i would say sci-fi movies in the l last 10 years because right. why i didn't want to do like an overall my top 10 favorite sci-fi movies because everyone knows the classics you've got predator you've got aliens you've got mm -hmm. et you've got star wars where no i like I think, that because you can think outside the box a little bit yeah like this, so you know. precisely so doing a current top 10 of you know your recently viewed see sci-fi film you can open the horizon to people that might have heard of the film but might not have seen it in listen to what our opinions on them might you know, persuade them to give it a try. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, whenever you're ready to do that at any point, let me know. Um, yeah. Because I'm excited to do that one. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you, sir, for joining me on another episode here. I much appreciate it, uh, uh, always, of course. Uh, if you have not checked out his channel, please go over there, subscribe, check out his videos. He does it, he puts in a lot of work, man. He, a lot of great reviews and stuff. So, please uh, go support this man. And Thank show you. some love. For the rest of you, uh, I am DJ Anubis, and this is the Metal Town Radio Podcast, and we will see you next time here on the Cinematic Synergy. Peace out. The